Good afternoon, everybody. So it's uh, my pleasure to be here in Barcelona this afternoon to discuss a little bit with you um, some uh, neglected aspect of the uh, hemodynamics in, in sepsis. And um, why is it interesting to look at the microcirculation? Well, basically, remember that microcirculatory perfusion is really a key determinant of the tissue perfusion in itself. And uh, not really the blood flow coming out of the heart in the aorta that is very important for the tissue itself. It's really what is uh, finely regulated inside the tissue, which will much more be important for the um, distribution of oxygen and nutrients. And when you think of this, you have some other aspects that becomes more important. And then you realize that the um, control of microvascular perfusion as a tissue level is determined by really other factors, and we will discuss these, than the factors usually uh, uh, affecting global circulation. Global circulation is mostly under the influence of adrenergic uh, agents and compounds and uh, vasomototone in this context um, also. Uh, and you will see that locally some other factors may really play a huge role. And the final and very important aspect is that the transport of oxygen inside the microcirculation from the red blood cell to the cell is regulated by diffusion much more than convection. So at this stage, the flow becomes less important than the distance between one single cell and the nutritive capillary. And so in this way, the density of the vessels that are perfused uh, are, is much more important and relevant for tissue perfusion than the speed at which the red blood cells are entering the piece of tissue. And this is nicely illustrated in several factors. This is just one of these, uh, adaptation to chronic hypoxia in animals. You can see that after a few weeks, the density of the capillaries is markedly increased here. And this is just done to minimize the diffusion distance from a single cell to the nutritive capillary. At the capillary level also, we have to realize what is really regulating flow. We have inside a given capillary the driving pressure that plays a role, but some other factors will also play a role. Of course, the length of the vessel is fixed. We cannot really change it. Viscosity will be affected, and especially we will have to discuss this when we discuss the fluid therapy we apply to our patients. But you can realize that the diameter or the radius of the vessel is much more important for the flow than the gradient in pressure between the entrance and the exit of the capillary. This means that a small vas vasodilation will lead to a major increase in the flow, even though there is a minimal drop in the pressure. And this is also something we have to take into account later on in discussion. But besides this, in addition to this, there, is some, there are some other factors, and especially the interaction of the circulating cells, which will play a major role, in addition, of course, to the viscosity. But if you think, what will exactly regulate the flow locally? What is responsible for the fine-tuning of flow? Well, just imagine, I have in my organ that I can skim it, make a figure like my hand. If I would like to have some blood flow to my thumb, but not really to my other fingers, how can the system understand that this thumb needs some flow and not the other part of this hand? Well, if you just think, I release some hormones that will go back to the heart, no, this will just increase total cardiac output, which will increase the flow to the thumb, but also flow to my other hand or my feet that doesn't need it. It's good in exercise, because indeed in exercise I need blood flow to all the parts of my body, my in the muscle of my left, hand, left leg and my right leg. But if I just need to fine tune to have some more flow here, I need to have the system to understand this 
backward. By backward communication. So this means that my tongue needs to communicate to the radial artery and maybe the brachial artery that there is some need of flow there. And to have this communication, there are some there are two aspects. The first one is perivascular sympathetic nerves that are really along the vessels. These are really along the vessels and will transmit information from the periphery to more central compartment to make understand that there is some need of oxygen and flow there. The other aspect is that the endothelial cells itself will serve as neurologic communicator. If you stimulate one endothelial cell here, there is elimination here of all these endothelial cells. And you can see that there is communication along the endothelium up to one millimeter. One millimeter in the distance of a cell is huge. So it is uh, like one kilometer if you are walking down here. So this is really a huge distance by which information is transmitted. And this is transmitted backward. So this means that centrally, the system knows that there is some need here in that piece of cell and not here in the other piece of cell. What occurs in sepsis? Well, in sepsis, we have data from literature showing that something may be wrong. In, in, and so these are some images uh, obtained in the lab. This is in pigs, and this is the uh, gut serosa. And so what we see here is that we have these venules, we have these capillaries, and you can see the flow in all these vessels. You can see the first quite rapid in all these vessels, and we have a high density of uh, capillaries there. What occurs in septic condition? The same spot uh, after peritonitis in the same animal. You can see that in venules, the flow is still quite rapid. But you can see that in some capillaries like this one, or uh, the, like this one, there is some problem. There is a, some absence of flow here. You can see that in some other capillaries, the flow is quite rapid, like in this area. And you can see also in this area here, we have this capillary here, perfuse, and then you see the red blood cells disappearing, and then a few minutes later, you can see that abruptly the flow is coming back in the same area. And you have this also in some other areas. Here, liver, you can see the uh, uh, portal area, and you can see here in the sinusoid, uh, well perfused sinusoid, and you can see in sepsis, you can still see some flow here in the portal area. We can see that total disappearance of flow in these areas, while some flow is still preserved there. And this is also true in the brain. You can see here the brain, again, of some pigs. You can see some venules, capillaries, and you can see a, a very nice density and flow everywhere. And you can see in sepsis was a decrease in the number of capillaries, and in some of these capillaries, no flow at all uh, in some of these vessels. So in numbers, there is very rapidly a decrease in the density of the uh, capillary that are perfused. And this occurs already within 30 minutes, but is marked within one or two hours when you already have this uh, marked decrease in functional capillary density. And you have this also not only when you give on the toxin, but also when you give here uh, we induce, let's say, a cholangitis uh, in these animals, leading to severe sepsis. And you can see that it occurs very rapidly um, in these uh, capillaries. It occurs in almost all organs. You can see here, it occurs in the gut, but also in sublingual area, also in the eyes of these animals. And once again, very early on, it occurs after the onset of sepsis. The second very important aspect we uh, realize from these experimental animals is that we have heterogeneity of perfusion. You have not only vessels that are not perfused, but in close vicinity to these, you have vessels that are totally normally perfused with a fast perfusion in these. And this will induce some chance. And you can see here in the liver, this is normal distribution of the velocities. And you can see that in sepsis, some are still perfused, some are slowly perfused, and some are not perfused at all. And you observe this also in the kidney. In the kidney, you can see the pattern of distribution normal condition, 
remains stable with anesthesia. And you can see that after endotoxin, you have a widening of the distribution, some areas are not perfused, low flow in some, and still highly perfused in some other areas. And so, from the early 60s to now, there have been a lot of trials showing exactly the same in different animal models. Decreased vascular density, so a decrease in the number of vessels that contribute to oxygen exchange. Absent or intermittent flow in capillaries, and heterogeneity between areas closed by a few microns inside the same organ. And this has been shown not only with endotoxin, but other model of sepsis, CLP, live bacteria, cholangitis, so a really very clinically relevant model of sepsis. And it has been shown not only in rodents, but also in large animals. And more importantly, it has been shown in all the organs, not only the gut, the liver, but also the kidneys, the heart, the brain, very important and essential organs. So, what are the consequences of this aggregation? Well, the first one and the most important one is this increase in the oxygen diffusion distance, so impairing the oxygen transport to the tissues. The second aspect is that when challenged, the microcirculation will even worsen in sepsis compared to a non-challenged solution. So, what occurs in you and me when we are submitted to hemorrhage, bleeding? We give blood to uh, the uh, transfusion level. So then we have, at the tissue level, we try to minimize heterogeneity in order to have better matching between flow and oxygen requirements. In sepsis, this is totally lost. When challenged, the septic animal will even further deteriorate, increase the heterogeneity instead of trying to minimize this. And this will have major implications because in this condition, the threatened system cannot easily face this uh, challenge. And this is responsible for the decrease in critical extraction capabilities in sepsis. So that the cells will be more rapidly lacking oxygen even though the total perfusion to the organ may be somewhat preserved. What are the potential mechanisms leading to this? The first aspect is that it is really not the infection, the strain itself, but it's really, like many other factors in sepsis, triggered by the inflammation as a whole. And so even without any infection, just giving TNF can lead to exactly the same insult. Second aspect is that the endothelial dysfunction plays a central role. So not only the lesions, but the dysfunction of the endothelium. And probably one of the very important aspects is the loss of neural control, the loss of communication. And so here you can see that the local response to a stimulus is preserved in the endothelium uh, in septic condition. But the distant communication is lost. Here at half a millimeter, you can see that uh, the stimulation is not trans transmitted to this area. And this is of course quite important because one area like my term that suddenly needs more oxygen is no more able in sepsis to communicate to central areas to say, hello, I need more blood here. And so they this area does not receive blood, even though blood is required at this area. Second aspect is the dysfunction of the endothelium, which is becoming more sensitive to vasoconstrictive substances. You can see here that the stimulation by endothelium, the endothelium is leading to more severe vasoconstriction than in control condition in these liver sinusoids. Another very important aspect is that besides the endothelial cell dysfunction, the glycocalyx, which is a small piece of uh, sugars here uh, covering the um, endothelium surface, is also dysfunction. And you can see here that the, this uh, glycocalyx size is decreased. But what is the role of the glycocalyx? The role of the glycocalyx is basically to facilitate, to promote the circulation of cells, 
inside the lumen so that they will less easily adhere uh, to the endothelium. The second very important aspect is that this uh, glycocalyx is not only some sugars, but you have also embedded molecules inside the glycocalyx. And these molecules that are embedded there are anticoagulant anti uh, molecules like antithrombin and also antioxidant, antioxidant substances that are embedded here in the glycocalyx. And by decreasing the size of the glycocalyx, there is also a decreased concentration of these uh, protective molecules. And so there will be, of course, activation of coagulation and activation of other uh, pr uh, problems in the endothelium. The next problem is the um, circulation of different cells, like here the white blood cells. And these white blood cells here, instead of being just flowing in the middle of the vessel, will stick to the endothelium, like you can see here, or even will block sometimes the microcirculation. And so rolling and adhesion of white blood cell to the endothelium is markedly increased. You may say, okay, this is initially totally normal. Yes, indeed, it's normal, because we have an infection. We have an infection, and what occurs when we have an infection? We have the white blood cells that needs to roll and adhere to the endothelium, and then to go inside the, the tissue. If there is no rolling and an adhesion to the endothelium, these white blood cells will just pass through the tissue and will never reach this infected area that you go uh, uh, to struggle with the, um, the strains. The problem is that in sepsis, this reaction occurs even in non-infected organs. And of course, this will affect many organs, including the brain and stuff like this. And this will have, of course, there some lesions that will be uh, uh, promoted by a rolling and adhesion of these white blood cells. But it's not only white blood cells, it's also red blood cells. You can see here these red blood cells, in instead of being just normally flowing in the capillary, are making this rouleau. And by this, there, is two, there are two problems. The first one is that the rheology is, is disturbed. The flow is less uh, adequate than in normal condition. But also, the possibility of these red blood cells to release oxygen is markedly de decreased because the surface available for the exchange is decreased here to this tiny proportion of the red blood cell instead of having the entire red blood cells able to release oxygen to that piece of tissue. And also, red blood cells will adhere to the endothelium in endotoxic conditions. Not only white blood cells, which is normal, but red blood cells, and these has normally to flow, and this will be really a problem. And if you look at what integratively what occurs in the liver, you can see here that the flow in the venules, meaning the flow in total organ, is preserved, let's say, up to the end. At the end only, it begins to be a decrease in total flow of the organ. But you can see that the flow in sinusoid rapidly decreases much sooner than the flow to the entire organ. So microcircuitary dysfunction occurs before the alteration in the flow in the entire organ. Also, you can see that rolling and adhesion of white blood cells and platelets occurs very early on, and it is contributing to these alterations in perfusion. And also, you can see that vasoconstriction also occurs in these, in these sinusoids. But interestingly, thrombosis of the microcirculation is really a rare event. You can see that it is very late occurring and in a very tiny proportion. So microthrombi are not very frequent. It's okay. So there is no relevance of the activation of the coagulation. No, no, no. This is totally different. Clotting is not frequent, but activation of the coagulation occurs. And activation of the coagulation together with the activation of the inflammation, and both are um, interplaying together and increasing one the other one. You can see that indeed there is here some 
fibrin deposition in these capillaries together with the impairment in flow and adhesion of platelet to the endothelium. So the activation of coagulation is important, but it does not really lead to microtrombi. So we will have to think to what could be eventually the therapies we may apply to the microcirculation. So we may summarize this alteration by first some impaired backward communication. And so this area here, not perfused, is not able to communicate with the central areas. Plugging, rolling, adhesion of white blood cell, red blood cell platelets to the endothelium. Outward glycocalyx, also impaired red blood cell deformability. And endothelial dysfunction, with impaired sensitivity to vasoconstrictive and vasodilatory substances. And so what we have, basically, is some areas non-perfused, not able to communicate centrally to have more flow, and some areas overperfused with more flow than required, and this led to the highest view two we see in sepsis. And the matching of flow to metabolism is totally impaired in sepsis due to these microcyclic alterations. Do we have this in humans? Well, we have this. And this is normal microcirculation, again with these venules, again with these capillaries, a rich network, all these are well perfused. And this is what we have in sepsis condition. In sepsis, we have these venules well perfused. And you can see here these capillaries well perfused. But you can see here also these capillaries. You can see these red blood cells not contributing to perfusion of this area. So this area here is totally deprived of oxygen for a couple of seconds or minutes. And this, of course, will lead to major alteration in tissue oxygenation. And of course, shunting is quite important because this one, this area is maybe too much perfused, while this area is not perfused at all. So, vascular in numbers, vascular density is decreased, venules are well perfused, and capillaries are de not well perfused with a decrease in the number of capillaries that are perfused and contribute to the oxygen exchanges. Heterogeneity is increased in sepsis, and this is really crucial in these conditions. And so from our initial description uh, 11 years ago, you can see a lot of groups throughout the world uh, in different countries, including here um, uh, US, including the Netherlands, including Germany, including uh, uh, Colombia, including Italy, including Argentina. A lot of several teams in different countries have shown exactly the same alterations. Decreased vascular density, decreased perfusion of capillaries, preserved venular perfusion, and heterogeneity between areas, which is once again crucial in this aspect. And again, this has been shown by several techniques, not only these microscopes, but other techniques like here, looking at the oxygenation in tinor eminence, showing that indeed there is some impairment in microvascular reactivity in sepsis compared to not only healthy volunteers, but also ICU controls in these conditions. And this also has been shown again and again in literature uh, since the first description by an Italian group in uh, 203. What are the relationship with outcome of these alterations? Well, this is, once your patients are resuscitated, an important factor associated with the poor outcome of these patients. But importantly, you can see here from this uh, interesting data that what is different in survivors and non-survivors? Well, the density of the perfused capillary is different but not the flow in the already perfused capillaries. So once a capillary is perfused, the velocity in that vessel is not differentiating survivors and non-survivors. But the density of the capillaries that are perfused and the heterogeneity are key factors associated with outcome. Another very important aspect is that there is no clear cutoff even though you may determine this with the rock curve, the, there is not clear cutoff separating survivor, good outcome and poor outcome. It is much more a progressive aspect. When the marker circulation is markedly altered, mortality is very high. However, 
there is a progressive decrease in mortality together with a progressive improvement in the market circulation. But it's very difficult to say that above a given threshold, your patient is safe, there is no more risk of mortality in this patient. It is an independent factor in multivariable analysis, just it is not the consequence of other factors. And more importantly, these alterations are more severe according to organ dysfunction, not only alive or dead, but also in survivors, severity of the organ dysfunction. And can be rapidly determined. Here, in the emergency department, quite a large series of patients looking at the microvascular reactivity, you can see that it was associated with the outcome of these patients, as well as lactate levels in these patients. But more importantly, it is dynamic meaning that when it changes, and it can be changed and improved by therapy, it will be associated with different outcomes. Here, a very rapid change within three hours of global resuscitation. The improvement in the microcirculation was associated the next day with an improvement in the organ dysfunction. However, when there was some stabilization or even deterioration of the microcirculation, the next day there was a deterioration of the organ dysfunction in these patients. Also, you can see that survivors and non-survivors have different outcomes, different evolution of the microcirculation. In survivors, the microcirculation improves with time during shock. So these patients are always receiving vasopressor agents. It never really normalized, but at least it improved in these patients. In the patient who will die during the shock period, there is no improvement, and you may expect this. But more importantly, in blue, these patients will resolve shock. They will be weaned from vasopressors. These patients fail to improve their microcirculation, but these patients will die later on of multiple organ dysfunction. And this is quite important because this highlights the link between microvascular alterations and later development of organ dysfunction in these patients. And this is also true in children. Hopefully, very few children die of septic shock, but when this occurs, unfortunately for them, there is a deterioration of the market circulation from day one to day two, which is not observed in survivors. And this is also observed with the microvascular reactivity which is high in, higher in survivors and improves in survivors while it stays affected in the non-survivors. And this is also true with other estimation of the microcirculation, like here with the ELO PCU2, which deteriorates in non-survivors while it improves in the survivors. But you may say, okay, you just show me something that is worse in non-survivors or patients with more organ dysfunction, but you may have perhaps the same just looking at blood pressure, uh, cardiac output, or whatever. Well, if you look really at these factors, it's not so obvious. Indeed, you can see that blood pressure is within the targets. The cardiac index is quite high, SVO2 is also quite high. The only single problem you can identify is the fact that lactate is quite high in this patient, even though you had normal blood pressure, high cardiac index, and high SVO2. So indeed, there may be something there with this high lactate that maybe suggests that there is a problem with microcirculation. You can see that there is no link between blood pressure here and the microcirculation, or cardiac output oxygen delivery, and the microcirculation here. And also, even though it's quite important to guide our recitation on these global factors, Reaching these surviving sepsis campaign goals, meaning as view to um, blood pressure, CVP, and so on, meeting these factors or not is not associated with a better microcirculation. This means that it does not preserve you from having microcirculatory alterations. You should not neglect this factor, but at least you should not be reassured once you get to this point. Of course, if we discuss therapy, one of the things we have to discuss is, is this really a primary event or adaptive 
phenomenon. Just adaptive, why? But yes, because indeed, I just mentioned that the microcirculation is a good way to adapt to metabolism. So if we have a primary alteration in cells, these cells do not need oxygen. They may not need flow, of course. So how do we know if one is occurring or the other one? Well, we have several aspects in literature suggesting that indeed there may be really a primary event. The first aspect is that if you look at a single perfuse capillary, the difference between the oxygen saturation at the entrance and at the exit of the single perfuse capillary is increased, not decreased. This means that the cells surrounding this capillary, which is perfused, are able to use all the oxygen that is provided to this area. The second aspect is that we have a heterogeneity of flow and we have also some heterogeneity of expression of hypoxic genes like HIF gene expression. And HIF gene induction is co-localized with the areas that are not perfused, meaning that the areas that are not perfused are generating some hypoxia. There is also in different organs here in the kidney an increased alteration in the microcirculation together with an impairment in the function of the organ. But more importantly, there is also, as you can see, a close relationship between the proportion of dysfunctional vessels and the alteration in the redox potential, meaning occurrence of hypoxia here in these uh, areas. And also we can see that it is totally co-localized. Once again here, some marker for hypoxia here, and you can see here also these rebel cells not flowing, while these are really flowing in the other part of the tissue when there is no expression of these hypoxic genes. And also the redox potential that is also altered here, while it is well preserved in this well perfused area. And once again, in another organ, the same aspect of the, uh, uh, the higher perfusion uh, associated with a, a good redox potential, a poor perfusion associated with an increase in alteration in the redox potential and thus hypoxia in this area. And perhaps more importantly, the alteration in flow is coming before the alteration in organ function. Here you can see in brain that the alteration in perfusion occurs first with preservation of the function and later on a decrease in evoked potentials in these neurons after the de first the initial decrease in the perfusion of the brain. And finally, the CO2 production is decreased in is not decreased, sorry. And so if you have altered metabolism that come first, you have shut down of metabolism, so you consume less oxygen, but you also produce less CO2. And you can see here that gradient of CO2 is increased with impaired flow, meaning that indeed the cells are still trying to survive and produce CO2 in these conditions. And finally also, when you manipulate the system, when you improve the superfusion here with the butamine, you also deep an improvement in the redox state here. And in patients, what you have is that the better you improve the microcirculation, the better you decrease the lactate level in your patient uh, later on. So obviously, this seems to be a primary event. How can you treat the microcirculation? Well, we can look at different agents. And the first, of course, would be to look at the impact of fluids. In experimental conditions, it seems that fluids may somewhat improve the microcirculation. But look at this. Giving early on fluids improves somewhat the microcirculation in these animals. It was not totally normal because you still had some low perfusion areas here that were not present here. But nevertheless, it is much more normal than unrecitated animals. But when fluid recitation was delayed, you can see that the impact of fluids was less obvious. So if you give fluids, you have to give it in a timely fashion, rather be rapidly on. And this is also true in humans. The impact of fluids we observed here was markedly 
present when we give fluids within 24 hours and in most patients even within 12 hours of the recognition of sepsis. However, when we give fluids later on, after 48 hours, the impact of fluids was no more observed. We can say, but this is just because the total cardiovascular system was also responding better initially than later on. Now, you can see that there was absolutely no link between changes in cardiac index and changes in the microcirculation, or changes in blood pressure and changes in the microcirculation. So the global hemodynamic response cannot help you to predict what occurs at the microcirculatory level. And remember, probably, if you want to give fluids for the microcirculation, early on you have an effect, later on the impact is quite limited. The second aspect is probably that you need to give us some amount of fluids, but later on the effect is uh, somewhat blunted. Here, quite an um, interesting um, uh, trial from um, Frédéric Potcher in Paris, who looked at the impact of fluids. And so basically, the first dude uh, did a passive leg raising test, okay, don't look too much at this. The most important aspect is here. They give some fluids to these patients. So they observed an improvement in microcirculation together with an improvement in cardiac output in these patients. But then they give a second bolus of fluid. They still observed an increase in the cardiac output. But you can see the microcirculation did not improve anymore. So you have some minimal amount of fluid that needs to be given for the microcirculation. But once this is observed, giving more fluids will not affect anymore the microcirculation, even when it further improves the cardiac output of your patient. So the adrenergic receptors on white blood cells and on red blood cells and on platelets may play a role in by decreasing adhesion and rolling is not only the improvement vasodilation at the entrance of the tissue, which is important, but also this impact on the circulating cells itself. What about vasopressor agents? Well, we have to separate two aspects. The importance of blood flow and blood pressure on one hand, and the potential effects or side effects of, micro, of uh, vasopressors uh, on the perfusion itself. The first aspect is that indeed pressure may be somewhat important. Here you can see the microcirculation in the brain that is altered initially, even though when there is no change in blood pressure and when there is an increase in cardiac index. But you can see that at later stages, the decrease in blood pressure may be associated with a decrease in microvascular perfusion. And indeed, we observed in the lab that animals with low blood pressure at more elevated alteration redox potential lactate per rate ratio in the brain compared to a normal to a uh, normal tensive animals. And this is true also for other factors like glutamate and glycerol markers of cell injury in the brain. But there is no clear cutoff. You cannot see that a given pressure level is associated with a good marker circulation. So once again, difference between blood pressure targets and vasopressors, because indeed, if we remember how our vasopressor agents work, well, first, what is evolution of blood pressure across the vascular system? Well, we have this level of pressure in central aorta, very close in peripheral, peripheral arteries, and then a drop in your resistive artery loads. So because indeed, the resistive artery loads are raising blood pressure because they are leading to resistance to flow. Then we have the entrance of the capillary, the exit of the capillary, and then some change in pressure in venules up to the right atrium. What occurs if we give a vasopressor agent? We increase the blood pressure. Where? In the aorta. Why? Because we increase the resistance in the resistive arterioles. But the drawback of this is that there may be some decrease in pressure at the entrance of the capillary, because the capillary are downstream the resistive arteriole. So if you visit constrict of resistive arteriole, you may have less flow downstream, even though you increase the pressure upstream. And the second negative impact is that we also have vasoconstriction on the venous side. So there is an increase 
in the outflow pressure of the capillary. So the gradient for pressure here may be decreased. And if you vasodilate, you just have the reverse. Do we see this in uh, animals or humans? Yes, we see it. Here, no penetrin or vasopressin, increased blood pressure, but decreased microvascular perfusion in these animals. And here in cardiac surgery, with a constant flow, because it's a cardiopulmonary bypass, you can see that giving vasopressor, norepinephrine, uh, increase the blood pressure, but decrease the microcirculation in these patients. And in non animals, could have the same, giving some vasopressors impairs the microvascular perfusion. But these trials was done, were done in normal intensive sepsis. And even in the cardiovascular department, the blood pressure was somewhat preserved. So what occurs when you really give an agent that is vasoconstricting, but you have really severe hypertension? The fact is that indeed, when we have hypertension, some organs especially are more sensitive to the decrease in pressure. So there will be a total decrease in blood flow to the organ. So by restoring the blood pressure, we may restore the pressure to the organ. Even though at the micro level, there may be some slight impairment, the total aspect will be that there, will be an, there may be an improvement in perfusion to the organ and hence to the microcirculation. And indeed, when you correct very severe hypertension in these animals by norepinephrine or vasopressin, then there is indeed an improvement in the microcirculation in these animals. And the same is true here. You can see an improvement with norepinephrine when correcting severe hypertension in these animals. <coughs> and this is true also in humans. Correcting severe hypertension is associated with an improvement in microvascular reactivity. Admittedly, there are some variability in response, with some patients improving more than some others, but nevertheless, there is globally an improvement in microcirculation. What is what are the optimal blood pressure targets for the microcirculation? Well, this is more difficult. Because indeed, we have several trials doing like this. 60, 70, 80, or 65, 85, whatever. And no major change in microcirculation. However, you should look closely at the individual level. And you can see here that even though globally there is no change, some patients had a marked improvement in microcirculation, but also some patients had a marked deterioration of microcirculation. So that's a problem. If you do not measure, it's probably safer to keep on the low pressure because you have a price to pay with the higher doses of agents, whatever. But at least some patients may perhaps, in some condition, benefit from a higher pressure uh, for the microcirculation. And this has been repeatedly shown here again uh, globally, a uh, more pronounced improvement in microcirculation, but nevertheless, some patients improve quite well, while some patients have even a deterioration in the microcirculation uh, for the same increase in blood pressure. So vasopressor agents really have a dual effect on the microcirculation. On one hand, these agents decrease microvascular perfusion by constriction of precapillary sphincters. That's a bad thing. The good thing is that the achievement of minimal perfusion pressure is needed to preserve the organ perfusion, enhance the microvascular perfusion. And it's very difficult to define in a given patient what is a good balance between high dose of vasopressor and good pressure to the organs. What about vasodilation? Indeed, if locally you apply a potent vasodilator agent, then you observe a marked improvement in the microcirculation. And this can also be observed by giving some nitroglycerin here. However, you can see that in a larger series of patients, this impact was last. I mean, no major difference here with nitroglycerin compared to placebo. But admittedly, the microcirculation in these patients was somewhat good already at baseline because they included these patients later on. So a, a late effect compared to a more early effect in the old trial. So, is that really good or not? I don't think it's a good effect. 
And we just we did something in the lab which was quite interesting, is to give another product to these animals. So another video of that later. There was an improvement or better preservation of microcirculation, circulation, but no impact on outcome, no impact on organ function. Why? Maybe because you dilate some areas, but basically you may not really recruit the microcirculation, and there may be some uh, steel phenomenon because you over perfuse some already perfused areas. And so it's probably better to really redirect flow to some areas than really increasing flow in some already perfused areas. So should we try to modulate endothelial function? Probably yes. And there are some data that some drugs, and some of these are quite cheap, can be used to improve the microcirculation. Here, ascorbate, vitamin C. Vitamin C, which is um, improving the microcirculation in these rodents. But interestingly, it was also improving the microcirculation when it was given one day, 24 hours after the insult. So it was still effective when it was given quite late after the onset of infection. The most interesting aspect with this drug is that it seems to be active and dependent on the function of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. You know that there are three other forms of the endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And so they looked at animals knocked down for neuronal, inducible, and endothelial enosynthase. And ascorbate was still effective in NOS deficient animals, in INOS deficient animals, but it was no more efficient in ENOS deficient animals, meaning that the endothelial nitric oxide synthase is crucial and needs to be present to um, uh, have the effect of this compound. And then this led to the last compound that can be effective because BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin, is closely, looked, closely linked uh, with the vitamin C. And BH4 is a very important cofactor of the um, nitric oxide synthase and especially the endothelial NO synthase. And to be functional, this NO synthase needs to be coupled, meaning that BH4 needs to be there. And then indeed, when arginine is uh, uh, present in uh, conjunction to oxygen, there is production of uh, citrulline, but mostly nitric oxide, which then will lead to vas local vasodilation. What occurs if we miss BH4? There is BH4 depletion. Then the presence of oxygen and arginine will go to the same enzyme and will then produce radical oxygen species and especially peroxy nitrate. And when you give back some BH4, you may prevent this uncoupling and reverse the decoupling of the drug. And in the lab, what we did is to give tetrahydrobiopterin. And you can see that in these animals, we improved the microcirculation um, in these areas. We also improved the heterogeneity of perfusion in these animals. And much more importantly, we also improved the organ function, we decreased vascular permeability, and there is also an improved survival in these animals given tetrahydrobiopterin. So probably this is one of the way to go to try to treat the microcirculation. And once again, this is a very cheap compound, easily uh, uh, available on the market. So in conclusion, multiple experimental and even clinical studies uh, suggest that microvascular perfusion uh, is accurate in sepsis, and this may play a key role in the pathophysiology of sepsis and the development of organ dysfunction in sepsis. These alterations are related to several factors, mostly, of course, inflammation, but uh, true endothelial dysfunction, and interaction with circulating cells. And because of these mechanisms, this makes quite unlikely that most of our classical hemodynamic recitation will be a lot affecting the uh, microvascular perfusion. So we need to try to find some other type of agents than just vasoactive substances. And in this condition, trying to modulate the endothelial nitric oxide synthase seems to be quite promising, but of course we need some more trials to really uh, confirm these uh, preliminary data. Thank you very much for your attention.